So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second session of our BDTI Essentials course. We're very to have we're very happy to have you here. Today we will be discussing some data cleaning and transformation essentials. Um, but before we dive in, let's just go through some quick guidelines to make sure it's a nice productive session. Um, the chat and Q&A widgets are located to the right of the presenter screen. If you don't see them, you might need to click on the three buttons um, beside the chat icon to enable it. Um, the session will be recorded and available after the session shortly afterwards. Um, if you have specific questions related to the course content, please post them in the dedicated Q&A widget. Um, and please feel free to participate in the chat during the session. We want it to be a engaging and interactive morning. Um, and please stay respectful. Um, next slide, please. So yes, this is where if you don't see it by default, if you click on these three buttons on the bottom right beside the chat icon, it will enable the Q&A. So the running order for this morning, we will have a short recap on session one. We'll dive into data cleaning and transformation. We'll get to some of your questions and then we'll have a wrap up session, which will introduce some um, information for the next session. If we don't get to your question during the session, please do post it in the course discussion board. You'll get a link to that and a follow-up email, which will be sent straight after the session. And yeah, a bit about you. Um, it's great to see we've got lots of people from all over Europe, some from the US, welcome. Um, and from across public, private and academic sectors. So a very warm welcome to you all. Um, without further ado, um, I would like to pass the floor over to um, Maria Claudia who will give a quick introduction to um, BDTI and she'll recap some um, from session one. So enjoy the webinar. Thanks a lot, Kim. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm very happy to see you back today. This is Maria Claudia from the European Commission and together with my colleagues, we are super happy to, to host this second session of the Big Data Test Infrastructure in session, Essential course. So if we go to the next slide, as already presented uh, two weeks ago, let's just try to recap what is this program. So the Big Data Test Infrastructure is uh, an initiative that is founded by the Digital Euro Program. And uh, in few words, it is a free data science playground deployed in the cloud for a data-driven public sector, where European public administration can experiment with data for free. So if we, if we move to the next slide, uh, you can see uh, that we are offering many, many tools. And please note that this infrastructure, this big data test infrastructure, is not just for big data. If you're working with small data, it's fine. It's not a problem. So this is, in general, it's, a, I would say, a perfect uh, Swiss knife for crunching information. And there you can have a lot of tools for your data journey. We really aim to, to promote open source, and the use of open source tools in the public sector for many reasons, you know, for, also for many benefits. We have, uh, we are pushing for transparency, but also for cost efficiency, and also for vendor independence. If we move to the next slide, um, you can see why uh, also, why we are trying to approach public administration, because our goal is really to support uh, uh, the European public sector in general, moving forward, developing digital and data skills. Uh, we are trying to provide this training. We are primarily targeting data beginners. So that's a not, not at all a training for data experts. This should be clear. And we are also targeting local, regional, and uh, national mini public administration. In, in particular, I will say that BDTI wants to help. Uh, BDTI is just the acronym for Big Data Test Infrastructure, wants to support this public administration that maybe they don't have in place dedicated resources and also infrastructure. You know, we want to provide them with the necessary onboarding services and also with ready to use tools so they can start immediately experimenting with uh, data driven products. At the same time, we are uh, really trying to foster collaboration between a uh, public sector at each level, but together also with academia, private companies, uh, citizen and why not students that maybe are doing their thesis or their PhD so they can help a specific public administration or more than one in developing an amazing idea for public good. 
The process to apply is very, very light and also it's very, very easy. Please check out our website. You have the link here also in the chat. Thanks a lot, Kim. And this is completely free. So spread the news around your network. Then if we move forward to the next slide, you know, in order to demonstrate how to use the infrastructure, how to leverage the product, and also how to understand a little bit better the benefit and the potential of this infrastructure, we develop session by session a concrete use case. And that's why we define a fictional use case. You know, this it's because it's going to be easy to follow. And uh, what we are going to do together can be easily reused, adapt in different contexts and in different domains. In our, uh, let's say, fictional use case, we have Zoe and uh, her team. They are currently working in an in a educational department of a hi very highly polluted AU region. And they want to understand and to identify universities that are working on uh, innovative green projects. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they want to start new projects and they want to find good partnership with good people to address pollution issues together. So the idea is that they are looking around, they are not expert at all about data science, and they are looking for the right data, the right information, and also the right tools. After, after researching a bit, they discovered the European Data Portal. It's something we already presented uh, two weeks ago. This is an amazing resource for open data. And there they found a rich open data set with the list of projects and the list of universities that are developing green projects. That's not fictional, that's uh, reality. They also found another website and they found data set with information about uh, countries and the CO2 emissions. Unfortunately, they don't have in place infrastructure, they don't have in place any tools to crunch data. And they discover the big data test infrastructure. So they apply, they sub submit their pilot, the European Commission quickly reviewed the, their idea, the idea was approved, and then finally they can start developing the, their, their report, they can inject their information, and they can create insight. That's very important because based on this new tool, they can also keep this report updated and uh, share with different audiences. If we go to the next slide, you probably remember that in the, in the first session, I was using this metaphor, no? Data analysis is a, lo a lot like cooking. You, have, you need to have in mind a specific goal, a specific business challenge. In this case, it's about finding partnership between university. And then you need to have specific ingredients and the right tools to merge all together. If we move to the next slide, you can see that in the first part, in the first session, we try to collect raw ingredients. There we learn about the European data portal and how we can access open data from different data sources. At the same time, we also try to access different data formats. You know, more specifically, we access CSV, Excel file, and JSON. These are very common uh, format that you will uh, face if you are going to to be a data, a data enthusiastic. Today, we are with session number two, we are going to clean and prepare them together. We are going to start slicing, dicing, and try to have a correct shape, you know, something that can be reused easily for the next session. And like ingredients, you need to understand what you need, the quantity, the quality, the format. And then you need to also be very, very clear about how you want to mix all together to ensure the highest quality outcome. That's going to be, I would say, one of the main focus for this session. Then if we move to the next slide, thank you. You can see that we, uh, I already saw some question in, uh, in the chat today. All the material, all the recordings, also the exercises are going to be public and are already public for, from the previous session. Um, after this course, we hope that you will be ready to start your data journey and also to apply for this great opportunity to have this free infrastructure in your public administration to experiment with data uh, for the public good. Again, all the material is available and uh, together, if you go to the next slide, you will start seeing in our repository a list of resources that are growing uh, every week 
and or you can already find some interesting uh, link about Python Jupyter Notebook, about R, about NIME, and also something, uh, of course, about statistics. Uh, let's now review our homework with our colleague Skalk in Trinidad, and then let's start cleaning and transform our ingredient, our data. Thanks a lot, Trinidad and Skalk. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria, Claudia, and Kim for the introduction. Good, yes, we uh, had a quick intro, a recap of last week's session, but just so that we are all on the same page and made sure you understood the exercise, because that's the most important thing to practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. Let's actually jump into the exercise review, Trinidad. And what are we, what are we going to be starting off with, with the exercise review? So let me quickly take the screen from you, and we're going to start from the beginning. So accessing the BETI framework. So when everyone um, gets access to the BETI, we can go to the landing page here. And then in the BETI portal section, we can actually access the framework itself. And, and that's with the, the logging details that they get when they apply, right? In exactly. So here's automatically because I have everything set up from before. And whenever you have all your credentials, you're going to land in the BETI framework itself. So here we are on the framework. As we saw on the last sessions, we have my account with all my details. In the service catalog, we have the different um, open source tools where we launched one, uh, sorry, three last time. And on my services, we can see the um, tools that are already uh, ready to work. In this case, today, let's work with nine. So I'm going to quickly open. And as we saw last session, it's going to ask for a password, which is stored in my data. If we quickly go on top of the um, tool, we can copy the password, click here, send the password, and we are inside of our virtual machine, which is where NIME is contained. Excellent. I'm going to grab the screen quickly again before we continue. So we first thing is you need to have access to the tools. So we showed you quickly again, reminding you where to go and access the PDTI framework. Again, uh, for those who are watching, uh, Maria Claudia already mentioned all the tools are open source. You can also download them and do the exercise if you do not yet have access to the BDTI portal. Next step is that you went now to the repository. So we also saw that slide from Maria Claudia. Mm -hmm. We downloaded the, the uh, exercise uh, with the instructions. And then what you probably would have uh, had to do is um, open the NIME workflow, right? Exactly. So maybe we can speak a little bit just to make sure everyone understands what is the NIME file type and how to actually import it to the... Um, exactly. The so platform. on the repository, there is a workflow. So the KNWF, so it stands for NIME workflow. And that's what everyone uh, was able to download from the repository. There's also another type of uh, file, which is the KNAR KN archive. So that's a folder, and in this case, we're not going to work with them, um, and we're going to quickly show how to work with the workflow. Let me take off the screen from you again, and let's dive into NIME again. So as you show on the last on the previous session, here we are in the analytics platform, and if we go to my local space, which is basically a folder, I can import a workflow. Um, just clicking there. And yeah, yeah, you can create a folder again, or you can add it to a folder that's already there. Exactly. Yeah. So here, for example, I'm going to go to my webinars folders, and I can also import it from there. So let's quickly go over the solution from last exercise. And um, as we see here, we have the use case with the instructions. And let me make it a little bit bigger. And here we have the use case. So and here, this is exactly if you if people would open it. This this is what they will see the first. Yeah, time, exactly. Right? Yeah. So this is the workflow, and here are the instructions that we put for the first session. So here we have I don't know the different uh, objectives that Soy has, and we started with the session one, which was data access and data exploration. So what about going and start with the different data files? So Soy she had access from data from Horizon 2020 and Horizon 2021. And the data were, uh, came in different um, data files, so in CSV, JSON, and in Excel. So let's start reading 
quickly the first data set, which was organizations in CSV. So we go to the notes repository, which are where all these little boxes are stored. And let's quickly look for the CSV reader. So if we just drag and drop, this is actually what Zoe did. So she drag and dropped the CSV reader, and then she went into the configuration. So we're going to quickly go here. And the data file was stored relative to the current workflow in this case. Do you remember what was uh, CSV standing for? Uh, comments, comma, uh, separated value, exactly. something like that. Exactly, so yeah, yeah. separated value. And, but sometimes the comma is not actually a comma. In this case, it's a semicolon. So here, remember that we did the column delimiter. If we go and we check for a comma, it's not going to read, it's not going to recognize, because in this case, this file is in a semicolon. So we just put semicolon, and it access the data straight away. Let's open quickly the data and check how it looked. So here we have multiple columns. We have 177,000 rows, 25 columns, and a lot of information about the organizations that participate in Horizon 2020. And accessing the data and opening it in a preview like that, that is literally where the exploration starts, right? That's where you start looking at the column names, what might be relevant, might, what might not be relevant, um, in order to go and clean it later. Exactly, and then you get familiar with the data. Let's quickly access another of the data sets. For example, let's go with Horizon 2021 and let's access um, the vocabulary, the science vocabulary. We can drag and drop the data itself. And as in this case, the data file was in an Excel format, the analytic platform recognizes the data format and gives you an Excel reader. So in other words, you go to your Space Explorer with, where you know maybe where it's saved in your folder and you find it there and you just drag it in. Yeah, exactly. Same as with the node. And the last um, data format that we saw was this a little bit more tricky data format, which is the JSON, which is an object. And we, but we proceed with the same process. So we read the data first with this orange um, node. And in this case, we need a JSON path to connect. So here in the JSON path, if we open the configuration, let me make it a little bit bigger. We see that here we have the different columns and, and then we select them and we add the, the different JSON path. Then when we read the data, we will see that we have our columns, but the data itself is all nested in one long list. And we need it in a tabular format. So same as an Excel or the CSV as we saw before. So for this, what we did is ungroup the, the data from the JSON object into a tabular format. And that was it for our first exercise. So I hope everyone had a lot of fun making this. And yes, and, and just to, to, to repeat what's now useful is that you have the, the different data types. So you have the JSON, you have the CSV, you have Excel, it could be a bunch of other ones. And what's useful is now you have it all in the same environment, the exactly. same tool. And now when you start working on your data sets going forward, it's all together, which is which is really powerful. All right, let me grab back the screen from you here so we can start with today's um, content. Okay, so we did the exercise review. We quickly showed you again how to access the BDTI framework, which should now become like a rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, and we also looked at uh, the, the solution. Again, the solution you can also find in the repository so you can work through it by yourself and compare what did you do right, what did you do wrong, because there you actually have the solution for today. Okay, so that's session one. Let's now move over to session two. We know already from, from before that we're gonna do data cleaning and transformation. Um, this is again session two of five, so um, that's kind of just structuring um, the webinar again uh, um, and uh, locating it. But for us to understand um, what we need to clean and transform, let's quickly remind ourselves the objectives that were there. Because again, you, you know, to know what to, to choose and not to choose, you need to link it to the actual use case and objectives. So what were the objectives? Well, actually, well, sorry, she got this data. 
and she needs she has a different objective so one of them is like visualized energy projects and on what level so on eu countries and also in the organizations inside of these eu countries that participate with these um, projects also she needs to identify and visualize the co2 emissions in these countries and link that information and see what's the relationship on energy projects and co2 emissions of those countries and also she wants to map all of this, so visualize all of this information um, on a EU universities level inside of a map. Exactly. And if we look at the end result, just to remind you again where we're going with the webinar series, once these objectives are now completed within the, you know, the data is crunched and it's reported, it would look something like this, right? Exactly. So we need to transfer from the objectives with the data and then what we're going to build is these different visualizations on the report. Exactly. So <clears throat> after today's session, what will the people be able to do? Well, so first, sign in into the BE Time framework, which is what we saw just two minutes ago, and initialize NIME in this case. Then prepare the data for next analysis by cleaning and transforming the data. So today we're going to start working with the data itself. And also by this, also address some data quality issues. Exactly. So let's jump into it. Um, data cleaning transformation high level high level because we're going to go into it deeply but what is it just roughly what is it so this is the very core part of the data pipeline and if we link it to soy's case she has all this amount of data but the data is not in the correct shape that she needs to get into this um output so here today what we're going to do we're going to clean and we're going to transform which is going to be the second building block of our data pipeline Exactly. And what, what it really means that in real life, when you work with, the, with, the, with data, when you go download it yourself, like we do in this use case, the data, we can call it dirty data. It's not clean, right? Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that is either not useful, not correct. Um, like you said, the shape's not right. And this is really where you need to do the wrangling to get it, you know, the dough into the right form before you start um, exactly. with your recipe. So let's jump into data cleaning now a little bit more in detail. And we can ask ourselves, why do we need to clean data, right? So the first thing is that we said already we have dirty data, but what does this mean? So I created this table. It's not relevant to a use case, but just to, to explain this for you in detail. So here's a table. Um, we have different columns. You can see as items here, the cost of these specific items, the store type, where were they bought online or uh, off-site or on-site. It's all from the same city. There's some VAT there and a delivery code. Now, um, if our goal, for instance, is to get the average uh, cost per store of, of the items or something like that, um, we can already, just from stating that goal, see that something like the VAT column and the delivery code might not be useful, right? Yeah, exactly. Th th this, these columns are just not useful. So why not just get rid of, rid and, of that, and right? And then we can just reduce a little bit exactly. what we're going to use. The same thing here, we can see this one row um, has information that's really not useful. I mean, it says cancel, there's a lot of missing values. I mean, again, why just not get rid of it, right? So uh -huh. this is kind of what we need to do is look at the things that are relevant, not relevant, and filter them out. Exactly, and clean them. And clean them. Second reason is that you might have missing values, right? So now here we can see the table. It's an item, but the cost is missing. Mm -hmm. And if we want our uh, data to have integrity, if we want to do calculations and get insights later on it, we need to make sure that the data is accurate. So now I need to make a decision, or the person, Zoe and her team, need to make a decision what to do with these values, right? Are we going to make it a zero? Are we going to filter it out? Are we going to take the average? Uh, or maybe have a reference. We have a reference here as 50. We need to decide what to do with it. Again, exactly. that's the, the integrity of the data. Another reason might be um, that also has to do with data integrity is, is do you have duplicates? So here we, uh, we have a duplicate twice couch, and, and let's assume here it's exactly the same entry, right? Now we need to say, hey, we don't need both. It's not going to, you know, affecting the average or something like that. It's right? not going to be accurate, the value in the average. Exactly. So these are all reasons why you need to go and clean your data. So if you have your table looking something like this, in the end, when you clean it, you clean it up. You can see this is nice and you uh, nice and neat. And in the end, you keep what is essential, right? This is what is essential for us mm -hmm. in order then to go and, and do the next step in our in our data. All right. So we've now explained this conceptually. Do you want to show us um, live how you actually do this with the data sets uh, that we're working on from Zoe? Yeah, exactly. So let me quickly take the screen from you. 
And so here we're in the workflow. And as we saw just two minutes ago, we read the whole data, Horizon 2021. And after we ungroup the data, and if we see here, we don't need all the columns, right? So we have here the projects and what we decided on the last session, it was that we need, for example, um, economic columns. So how much the European Commission um, fund this project? When was the starting date, the end date, for example, of the project? So let's start maybe filtering the columns. And the nice thing here is that if we go on the node repository and we need to, what we need to do now is filter. So if you go and filter, look for filter, it's going to suggest some operations that we can do by filtering. And in this case, we need to filter the columns. Let's quickly drag and drop. And if we connect the data and we configure, we can see that automatically is including all the columns. So what we need to do first is select the columns that we need. So here in this case, for example, we need the ID of the projects. We need dates. So we need the end dates. We need the start date, which is here. Then we need maximum contribution of the European Commission. And what else we need? We need the total cost of the project. We just click OK, and then when we run this, we can see that our table is way smaller. So now we have five columns instead of the 20 that we had before. Exactly. Let me quickly just grab the, uh, the, uh, the screen again from you, and I want to just reinforce this principle uh, by summarizing it in the steps. So we showed you what data cleaning is. We had a quick example. We'll jump back to some more of this live. But if you now take what, what Trinidad did and put this into steps, you can break it down basically into three steps, exactly. right? Exactly. So the first step is you explore your data. Which is what we just did. We read it, we open, open it. Open the table, right? You looked at it. The second step is to identify the column. So this is what we did, right? This is what you did when you said, hey, we need the ID one, we need the, uh, the, the starting one. date, exactly. et cetera. And then once you've identified them, um, you have to sort them out. And the third step, we'll get to that in a, in a moment. So step one, let's make this clear again, explore the data. How do you do this? You do this with watching the raw data or opening it in one of the tools. Uh, we can also look at the statistic tabs as another example of that. Um, and secondly, you identify your columns uh, with, the, with the ones you need. And let's actually just make this even more clear for the people and go uh, um, do this for the different data sets. It's by one. So it's not confusing when we just do it live. Let's actually do it a little bit more in detail. So exactly. the first one is the organizations. We looked at the projects already. So again, looking back at the objectives we had, uh, and we look now at this organization step. Now let's explore it. Let's identify the columns to filter. Exactly. Right? So for example, we have one of the uh, most important data sets that we have is organizations. And here, as the name states, we have the organizations that participate in this Horizon funding projects. So from here, we can extract, for example, project ID. We can extract the name of the um, organization and activity type. So that way we are gonna uh, recognize if it is a public uh, organization or if it's a university, which is our main goal, and also some address information for working later on. And again, this is simple. You're going to filter the columns. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So here we did the project one already live, so don't, we don't need to repeat this one. But then if we look at uh, another uh, data set here, for instance, we have the one about um, the information on the project titles. So oh. again, here we need to decide what what we need and here it's only about two of the columns we yeah so here for example we have the information about the project itself and also the topics of the projects and we're going to see later on an exercise that we're going to do with this and then what's interesting and, and this is now the next two data sets we quickly just quickly recapping on we're now speaking a lot about the column filtering but here for instance we can see in the country one uh, the column there's also something else going on there yeah so here we don't have only European countries. So in this case, we're going to do two filterings. One is going to be the country, the year, and the CO2 data itself. But we're also going to filter the rows, which means that we're going to only select the European countries, which are the ones that we need to work with. Okay. So that means you do a column filtering and a, a row, row filter. filtering. Exactly. And here's maybe even a, a better example of row filtering. So this data set it only contains the EU country 
names and codes. But if you can see there, there's also some non-European ones there on a row level, right? Exactly. So again, here we want to just select the European countries, which are the one that we're going to work with. Exactly. So do you want to jump quickly over and show us how to do a row filter as well? So that people know how to do the column filter and the row filter after identifying in step two, what is the, what they need to filter out? Exactly. Let's come back quickly first with the project um, data set. So here, after we filter the columns, we see that the order of these columns is not optimal, right? I mean, um, we have the end dates, the IDs, the starting dates, etc. So normally, after we filter the columns and so we select the ones that we need, we need to order this data set. So here, let me quickly jump into uh, resort our columns. And as we saw before, if we just click resort, we can resort our columns. Let me put this a little bit bigger. Here we have the columns that are inside of my data set. And I want, for example, ID to be at the beginning. So first I identify which projects I'm working with. So I put it to the first. Then, for example, European contribution, I want it to be in the end. So I move it to the last. And starting dates, I want it a little bit up to be just next to IDs. We go on OK, and then we can filter. We can see that our data set is in a more optimal um, format. If we continue with our um, European science vocabulary data set, we will go through the same um, process. So first, we need to filter the columns and select the columns that we want to work with. Maybe it's open the data set again and we just explore it, see okay. how it looks like. So if we open it there. That's a good idea. Yes. So now again, let's repeat the process. Step one, explore the explore data. Explore the data. Step two. Select the columns. Select the columns, which ones would be the relevant ones here. So here we want to work with project ID mm -hmm. and the European science vocabulary title. Okay. So th those are the two we want to keep, the rest we want to get rid of. Okay. Exactly. And now we go and filter it. And here we filter the columns. And as default, the node is going to include all the columns. And here we unselect, and then we select again the ones that we want. So we want project ID, and then we want the titles of the projects. Click on OK. And then if we see the data here, we just have two columns that we're going to work with. And as you can see, this column is Euros Euroscience Vocabulary not really meaningful the name of the column so let me um rename that column and let's put it topics so that way it's a little bit more meaningful and a tip here is that when you work for the tool analytics nine leaks platform and you kind of guess what operation you want to do and you're not sure which node to use the names are pretty intuitive, so you can kind of just search the action and it will come up. So rename, you just rename. Yeah, it so comes, it's very yeah. easy to use. And well, now we have the columns that we need, but also we need to filter something else, right? So here, Zoe, she needs to work with energy, green energy projects. And as we can see here, there's, I don't know, computer security, software, employment, which are very interesting topics. But for Zoe's case, she doesn't need all that information. So here, what we can do, as we filter the columns, we're going to filter the rows. And as you said before, we can just go on the node repository and search for what do I need to do? Filter rows. And I just find my row filter node, I drag and drop. Then I connect with my data set. And we configure. There's few features that we need to tell the node. First of all, which column we want to work. And in this case, we're going to work with topics. Second, what we need to look inside of the topics, the energy projects, right? So we're going to look for a specific string, which is going to be energy. And we map it this way, and we select contail wildcards. So that way, 
the node is going to look through the column and only select those rows where energy is included. So if I say it correctly, what we're telling this, the, the filter is to go look for uh, uh, rows uh -huh. with the word that takes the stream energy. Energy. And everything else we're going to throw away. Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And a last configuration is that here we have to decide if we include the rows by this attribute or if we exclude. In this case, we want to include only those uh, rows with energy inside. We click on OK, we run it, and as we can see here, we reduce to 2,600 rows, and only the topics are energy. So we have energy and fuels, electric energy, solar energy, so on and so forth. That helps a lot. I mean, we looked at data sets with over 100,000 uh, rows, 20 columns, and if you can start reducing it and cleaning it up, it makes the next operation a lot easier, right? Exactly. All right. So let me grab the screen again. Okay, let's take a breather. Let's see what we've done so far. We spoke about data cleaning. We said it's important for, for, for the various reasons we showed. And then we saw step for step what to do. You explore your data, you open the data set, you look at it. Mm -hmm. You identify your columns that you either need to filter out, or we also showed how to sort them or rename them. It's all ways of cleaning it. And then the third step is, is the missing values and duplicate um, duplicate values, right? So the ones that that are now you know challenging the integrity of your data set. So how you deal with them is also very simple. When you look at your data set, these values will be indicated, especially this is now missing values, by some other um, icon. Here we see uh, it with uh, the screenshot and analytics platform. It's a red question mark. This uh, tells you this is either null value or a missing value. And now you need to decide what to do with this value. Yeah. It's very simple. You'll add the um, missing value node and you open it up and you just tell it, hey, make it a zero, filter it out, make a... Average of the rest. Yeah, so it's yeah. very simple. Same as to, uh, you can do with duplicate values. You add the duplicate row filter. You choose which column to look in, what to do with the duplicate ones. You remove them, you keep them. And if there are multiple duplicates, which one to keep the first one, the last one, the average, etc. Very intuitive, but very important in your data cleaning uh, in the process is to tell uh, your tool that you're working with what to do with these values. So let's just recap the whole process. Three steps in data cleaning. You start off with your raw data that you explore. You make decisions on what to keep or not to filter and sort. Mm -hmm and also what to do, for instance, with your missing values. And then you want to take a rough table like that and clean it up. So from there, you can start doing transformation. And getting to and, the more optimal. And getting some of the, the actual insights, right? Speaking of data transformation, after data cleaning, you have to transform your data. What is it? Exactly. Well, so what is data transformation? What do we actually transform? Today, we're going to see two, transform two uh, main what? One is we transfer, we transform the shape of the table. And here is instead of cleaning uh, columns, we add columns with information that we extract. We're going to see an example later on. And also another information that we can uh, transform is the content of the cell itself. As we see here in this example, we have um, Chetia, but we need Czech Republic. So this is a manipulation inside of the cell itself. All right, so just to get it right, there's two things. You can either do a high level and you look at the table shape and you can add something. So you change the shape of your table uh -huh. or in the cell itself, you're going to do something, transform that value there, like we see in this example, right? But these are the two levels we're working on. Exactly. Okay. So why do we transform? We have too many whys, but here we're going to see just a few, uh, the most important for Soyuz case. One of the main whys that we're going to see is when we have same column in two data sets, but the data type is mismatching. What is the data type? So, for example, we have our project ID column, and it comes either on a string or as a number. But first, for example, a string would be the name of the countries. So it's text, right? Exactly, text. Then another data type would be number. So, for example, the total cost. So then we can do a mathematical operations on them. 
And the third case in, in this uh, use case is going to be the date and time, which is just the date. And in Zoe's case, she has data from Horizon 2020 and from Horizon 2021. The later on, she needs to work with all together in one data set. We're going to see on the on next session. But here she has that in Horizon 2020, the ID column comes as a number. And in 2021, the ID column comes as a string. So then we need both columns to be in the same data type to be able us to merge them together later on. So basically, you, you, have, you have to work with apples and apples. You can't have apples and pears because then, you know, the data doesn't merge because it's reading it as different data types. In this case, yeah, we cannot. Exactly. Okay. So that's one reason why you need to transform. And this is, again, on a, on a kind of a cell level, the value inside. What's another reason? Another reason is when we're missing some information, but we can extract it from, from the data. In this case, for example, Soy, she wants the starting year of the project, but she doesn't have a column called start year. But what she has, she has the starting dates. But as we can see here, the starting dates are as a string. So we need to do two manipulations here. First, we need to transform from start date from, from a string to a date type format to then be able to extract the year and add another column with the starting year. So here we're manipulating the data itself and we're adding one column. So we're transforming the shape of our data set. Adding another column, adding information coming out that you're extracting out of, out of the, the exactly. data set. Okay, so that's now two reasons why to transform. Let's go to a third one. Another one. What is another one that we so, have? So um, in this case, Soy, when we saw the vocabulary data set, she has, well, in Horizon 2020 and 2021, one project can have multiple topics. So one project can be about renewable energy, solar energy, so on and so forth. But in the data set, in the raw data set, we have, uh, for one project, we can have multiple rows depending on the amount of names. So what we're going to do here, we're going to tell, we're going to show Zoe how to group all these different topics into one single cell per project. And, and this is useful to, to group the same item together, right? So the same project to have all the values, that, in, in this case, as a list, yeah. it could be as a count or something else, but it's nice to group them together uh, and make your table a little bit more compact to work with later. All right, so that's three ones. And this one has to do with, this is kind of a combo, right? So you kind of changing the shape because you're making it short, the table shorter, you're taking rows out, but you then adding things into the right, list. Adding yeah. one column with all together. Right, and just to make this grouping idea a little bit more concrete, maybe because we're actually going to do it, mm -hmm. just make sure people understand what's happening with the grouping operation. What do we have here? Well, so here we have um, the data set. So we have the different projects ID, for example, and we want to group all those that belongs to project ID one all together into a, one other column that has all the different names all together um, as a list in the end. And so you have to choose the column that you kind of group mm -hmm. and then the ones that you want to then put together, right? So this is the concept, the group column and the ones that you then want to do some aggregation or some, some combining with, right? And this is very important to understand that, that concept of what happens when, when you group. Okay, sticking to our last example of why we need to transform. And this is also a very common one. It takes on different, different uh, shapes and forms, but what do we have here? Well, here is what is called the string manipulation. So, for example, we have all the European Union names, the country names. But in this particular case, we have Germany with including former GDR from 1991. We don't need all that information and actually can be a little bit uh, complicated for later. So we only need Germany. What do we do here? We strip what we don't need. So here we're doing a transformation on a cell level. We're not doing everything in the whole column, we're just selecting a particular string and doing the manipulation on that cell. Exactly. And this can also be sometimes there's something that's misspelled or something that's in capital letters and, and you're working with same things case. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you want all your data to look the same, to normalize them, to transform them in the same shape, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you can't, you know, you're not going to match this stuff. It's not going to be reading and merging together nicely. Okay. Are we going to jump to the, before we do the recap, jump yes. to 
Now I'm going to use platform to show you how these transformations actually happen on the real data sets. Yes. So we started first by filtering and resort our columns, right, with the data cleaning. Now we're going to jump in into the data transformation. Here, as a reminder, we're working with the project data set. And as we saw before, we have the starting dates, the end dates, but so she needs the starting year of the project. So we're going to go through and help her how to extract the years and add another column. So first of all, we have our starting date, which is a string. So as I told you before, we need to switch from string to a date and time, um, time and date format. So we go onto our node repository and we look for a string to date and type. So as you mentioned before, what we need to do, if we look for those keywords, we can find a node related to that manipulation. So here we map the data and we select what we need to transform. As it is a string to date and time, the columns that it's going to recognize is only the string ones. Yeah, and here very, we very can, intuitive, very obvious, right? Exactly. Yeah. And we have to select what we need to do with the date and time. So we, in this case, we only want the date. And I'm going to tell the information, the instruction, to give the date format in year, month, I don't find it here. Year, month, and date. And we have all the selected, and I want to replace the columns. We're not going to add columns in this case. We go on OK. And as we can see here, dates are as a local date. So we did the first manipulation. Now we have to extract the years. So I can go and search for extract date and time fields. We drag and drop, connect, and here we tell the node what we want to do. First, what column I'm going to work. So I want the starting years. So I go and I select the starting dates. And as I want the year, I can extract straight away the year. And this, this is really the reason why you had to go from string to date and time file type, because it can identify this part as the year, this part as the month, this part as it. Exactly. And now you just choose the year because you want to, to get rid of the rest, right? Yes. And I just click on OK. And we can see here that we had add another column called year. One more manipulation here. It's a year. If I give you this to you and you never look the data, you don't know if this is a year, a starting year or an end year. So we're going to go straight away and change the name of the column. So we're going to go with a renamer. We select the column that we want to rename, which is year in this case, and we're going to add a meaningful name. Start year. OK, run. And we have our meaningful last column. So that's with projects. Let's go quickly with the energy rows. As we saw before in the previous slide, we had multiple here. For example, we have one project ID that has multiple topics, but we want to group the topics and have a, so group the project ID and have all the topics in one row. So what we do here is that we can go and select a group by node in this case we configure and first of all we have to select decide which column is going to be the grouping column and that's why that slide was so important to show the two columns and to choose the grouping one right the, the one that you want the stuff to be grouped yeah. exactly so here we want to group the project id yep. so all project id number one they're going to be all together and then we go in manner aggregation and we select the topics as what we're going to aggregate. In this case, we're going to concatenate, which is we're going to put one next to another. So it's going to be topic one, topic two, topic three. It's going to look like this. We go, concatenate, clicking OK, run, and voila. For example, this row here, we have project ID number, this big number, and it contains two topics. And one last step 
as we did here before, we have to rename the column because we have concatenate topic. Not really meaningful. We can go and rename our column and give it a meaningful name. New name, topics in plural, because maybe one project can have multiple topics. And as we saw, we have two columns now. We started with like five or six in this data set. Yeah, and so we cleaned them, built it out stuff. Now we transform them into the correct shape uh, and what we need to do. Next. Okay, so let me grab the screen again. So we do a quick recap of the transformation. So we felt, uh, we cleaned it now. And the what and the why as a recap for, for transformation. So what and why? Because we want to transform from raw data that is not in an optimal, uh, optimal shape to a transformed data that is tailored to solve its needs. So in this case, we did it this way. But for another use case, can be tailored to another, like with other um, functions. And again, just quickly, how how did we do this transformations? The the new nodes and operations that were introduced today. Quick recap: there, if you want to do something like uh, correcting the format from data one, we have the number string uh, extracted. There's a bunch of them that you showed us there with date and time. Etc. You get the point. Just as a recap, go visit them again um, later on for some clues when you do the exercise as well, and play around with with these yellow nodes as well. But we, again, we have a but. Just like last time, we had a but uh, in session one. Real life is not always as easy and so nice. You not only clean your data, filter out, and then do a little bit of transformation. Sometimes you have to go back then and clean, right? Exactly. It's not always a linear process. We just have to be very prepared that sometimes we have to clean, then we have to transform, then we have to clean again. In this case, for example, we have to clean the, and select the rows that we need, so all the European countries. But then we realize that some European countries are not in the correct um, language. language. So then we change it again, and then we as we change the name, we are able to um, clean again the data set and select the countries that we need. Exactly. So just the point of showing this slide is just to, to make you aware that when you work with real data in the real life, th this might be a, a little bit of a, the, the wrangling part, the cleaning, you know, the transforming of the data might have the cycle of, of doing a couple of things yeah. uh, in a nonlinear way. But, the concept is the same. Yeah, that's why, why it's very important that we practice, practice, and practice. Because um, the, as it is the core part of the data pipeline, it can take most of the time in the data pipeline. But once we have the data in the correct shape, clean and transform, we are going to get correct insights and data exactly. information. And I'm going to repeat it again just to emphasize how important this is. If you have garbage data going in, uh, to whatever um, and you know analytics procedure you want to do, if be it simple or or advanced, something like machine learning, whatever you want to do. If you have garbage data going in, you have garbage um, insights coming out. So this is why it's so important to clean the data correctly, transform it, spend a lot of time on it. This is the most crucial part. Otherwise, your insights are not going to be accurate. Just to repeat and emphasize it again. All right. So for today, when the people will go now, you can see here we had session one. You accessed data to explore it, the, mostly the orange nodes. Then you have the yellow nodes. This is the operations where you do the cleaning, mm -hmm. uh, where you can see here and, and, and the transformation. So this will be the output of today is when people go and do the exercise, this is what they're going to do, right? Yeah, they're going to have a workflow. So we still don't have a new data set. The new data set, the end of the ETL process, so the extract, transform, and load, is going to be in two more weeks, so in session three. There is going to, we're going to be able to extract a new data set. Now, the output is a workflow, which is our kitchen, where we're going to be able to clean and transform and do all these operations. Exactly. And also, we're not just going to load it next time, just to really give you a little bit of a, a, a insight or a, a teaser for next week. You can also see there's at least three different data sources there. I think the actual use case has six, seven, yeah. something like that. 
we're going to also blend and merge them next week. And that's why it's so important to clean the data so that when you do the, the blending and, and, and merging, uh, you can all you can merge all the that's, that's already giving you a taste for next week. Now you're building the workflow. This is what you'll be doing. Um, uh, and let's just quickly summarize what exactly did we do today? What should be the people be able to do when they go through the exercises? Repeat, watch the recordings, go check the resources uh, on the GitLab. What should they be able to do after today? Well, after today, sign in to the BTA framework again, which is what we did at the very beginning. So go onto the BTA portal, uh, Hoover on resources, etc., and initialize NIME, which is the tool that we use today. And Prepare the data by cleaning and transforming it, so that way we get it into the correct format. Exactly. And we also address the data qu um, uh, quality issues on multiple levels, but this can also include the missing values and duplicates. Okay, we already spoke about what you can expect for, for, for next week. We're going to say it again. Now that we've accessed the data, we've now cleaned and transformed it. Next week is also a really, really important one. It's data blending, so we have different multi uh, sources different formats, and now we're going to put them together in a nice one table, which yeah. is super important when you want to want to do um, your your insights later. And we're also going to do a little bit of exporting, right? And what are we going to look at just to give the people a taste? So we're going to be able to, we have this different data, seven data sources, we're going to funnel down to one, and then we're going to be able to export the data, and then maybe I can pass it to you, and you can work with it as I can work with it as well. Yeah. Are we also looking at databases? Yeah. Yeah. Also important next week or the next session, we're going to look at how, if you do work with databases, then how to, to store your new data set and how to for access it later it. and share it. Exactly. Again, practice, practice, practice. Uh, we already saw Maria Claudia spoke uh, about where to find the resources. Here's the link again. Uh, really important, the recordings, the slides, the, the um Solutions for, for the previous exercises plus the instructions for the next exercise, everything you can find there. So please go and have a look. Again, when you download the, the exercise for this week, it will look something like there. You'll find all the instructions once you imported the workflow uh -huh. into the Nine Analytics platform and open it. So go have a look at that. Um, and that being said, I think we can give back to Maria Claudia and team for the Q&A section. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Skalk. Thanks a lot, Nidat, for uh, this uh, interesting session. I think now we are, got the, we are getting more familiar with our use case, also with our uh, objective. So if uh, I think now it's the right time to post questions and try to exchange information. So please, the audience, if they, you can post it our, in our Q&A section, we will be more than happy to, uh, to answer. In the meantime, we already reply, I think, to most of the question we we found in the chat and also in the Q and A. Uh, I still see another one from Milena. So, Milena, you were asking about data and um, access of private data. So, the point is that in BDTI, you can inject information, data set that are not related to personal data. So, if the information you are trying to ingest are from open data. Of course, you have name, it's not a problem, but the, you need to access the, the open data you're going to insert inside. So maybe if you want to elaborate a little bit more, I think you are referring to articles that have not been published. Um, but it's always, I mean, the, the important point is to check the license and the information you have in the data set. So, that's why we are we have just this condition for the big data test infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It's not because the environment is not safe, but because we are giving the, the environment to the public administration and we can't control what they are going to develop and also what they are going to deploy. You know, in case of data breach, the commission is not responsible. That's the main reason. So I'm not sure that I, I reply to your question. But if you are using uh, information that are public available, for example, in the web, it's totally fine. You can use that. Okay, then let me see if I see other open question in the chat and in the Q&A. 
Yeah, there is another one uh, that it's about uh, uh, quality, no? So, Skalk and Trinidad, you were um, focused uh, during the presentation about, you know, formatting the string, formatting the dates. So, how can you understand uh, the, the format you need to use and how you can understand how to connect the dots? You have these two data sets and you need, to, you need to connect them. Is it very easy with nine? Maybe you can elaborate just a bit more about the different format you can find uh, in the different data set. You know, we have, I understood we have dates, we have string, we have numbers. So can you just recap a bit on this? Thanks, yeah. Um, do you want to grab the screen and just jump to, to the platform? I think that's most useful. So if we understood the, correct, uh, the, the uh, question correctly, it has to do with um, the different data types, so we can quickly recap them. And then understanding how to to work different data sets and different how to identify them. I think the first one you, you can maybe show the different data types where to see it at least in the, in the. Perfect. So here, for example, when we read the um, raw data, we have the different uh, column names, but all here maybe you know all not all of them, but most most of them are in string. And here, for example, we have the number. Um, which is like European maximum contribution. So here we have a numerical value. And a numerical value is as it is. So for example, this is uh, millions of euros. And of course, this is a number. Another one that is a string, for example, is, mm, let me look for one that it makes sense. Here, the objectives. So here, this is text. So it's a string. That's what's it mean with a string. Also, the names of a country can also be a string. And uh, particularly, sometimes IDs uh, can be understood as a string as well. So here, for example, as a default is read as a number, but actually an ID, we can also um, understand it as a name because it's an identifier. Yep. And lastly, the dates. So here um, we need to transform this one because it was as a string, but actually for the program to understand that is the date, we need to transform this column into a date format. So that's why we did the rest of the process here, where we extract um, the date, but transforming for, first from the string to the date. Yeah, and to add to this, we had the example, and, and we'll see this, this is what you'll see when you do the exercise, um, two data sets, exactly the same structure. It ex refers to exactly the same things. It's, I think it was Horizon, was it the projects or the organization one? Where the ID columns, which is the ones you need to match the data, mm -hmm. it's the same column, but they are different data types, right? Exactly. So that's in organization. So we're going to see it um, in the next session, how we merge both of them. But to merge both of them, we need that the data type of the column that we're uh, joining with is in the same data format. And that's what we saw before, that ID is in a number in one of the data sets, and in the other one is as a string. Yeah. So it's not going to recognize that they're both the same. Yeah. And we could, uh, just to show it what happens, we can probably change it back, try and merge them and, and see it's going to fail, so you can see why it happens. That's probably a useful thing to do next time. Yeah. But you show that sometimes you do, and that's fine, you're going to try and do operations on your data, and you'll fail, and it might be because of a data type. And now you understand what a data type is, how to change it in, in, in case you get an error message that's saying, hey, the data type doesn't work, and, and how, to, how to go about it. Maria Claudia, I don't know if we answered the question. I don't know if you wanted to still add to something that, to that as well. It's, it's very clear. Thanks a lot. Uh, there is another question more, um, uh, again, related to this topic. And is from Boris that is asking, you know, that different data sources can have decimal delimiter different. For example, comma, dot. Are these tools uh, helpful to interpret and transform the, the data types? So I would say that maybe we can go back to the statistical, uh, uh, let's say, an overview of the data set, because this is very useful to have a quick overview of your data set. And definitely, I, at least from my experience as a data scientist, I can tell you that that's always a big problem when you need to manage different data set with different decimal delimiter. That's a very good question, Boris. But please, Scott, you can you can say more something more about this uh, nice view. Yeah. So what we see here, um, just to the question on the statistical overview, this is a very useful. We mentioned in the slide 
quickly. But if you want to get some quick insights when you open your, your data set for the first time, this is quite useful. You'll see that it uh, treats strings and numbers differently. So there's a different, um, uh, you know, we see the mean there, the maximum of your data set, but that only works for numbers, right? So you can see there's a lot of missing values for strings. Exactly. But you also have a column for missing values. So this is, a, is, a, is an interesting use case. Here you see no missing values because you probably already cleaned it. But sometimes already you can, you can see, hey, there's a column. Uh, that I'm interested in, I'm not sure it could have 200,000 rows in it. I'm not sure if there's a missing value, right? So you can open this quick overview and say, oh, there's 300 missing values. I definitely need to go clean this column. Or in this case, you see, you know what? This is a, there's no missing values in my columns here. So I don't need to, to handle them, right? So this is yeah. some of the insights. Maybe you can add to the, some of the aggregations and stuff. Yeah, so as we see before, um, and coming back a little bit with the data types. So do you remember that IDs, um, we normally treat them as a string because this is what it happens. If the data set, uh, so the, if the ID is um, interpreted as a number, we're going to be able to do operations on them. But you cannot do operations on, na on names, right? I cannot add my name and yours and then we have... Yeah, exactly. you can list them, but you can't like, you know... So that's why it's them. very important to have um, each column in the corresponding data type. Here, for example, total cost, we have a number, and that's correct. So then we have, for example, a maximum um, total cost, so that's the maximum uh, value of a project. And here we have, for example, uh, the sum, so the amount of millions of euros that they, they cost the different projects, so on and so forth. I would add one more example here. If you, for instance, quickly looking at your data sets, and uh, again, it's a question about uh, um, getting insights, what to do with cleaning transformation. Let's say you work with age here and you find uh, the minimum maximum, uh, and you see the maximum is 250, and you know it's an age column, you're thinking for yourself, hey, this, this does not make sense. There's an yeah. outlier here. That's, that's going to you know, affect my data later on, I need to get rid of that exactly. outlier. That's so this, actually a yeah. really good example. So there's a lot of ways where, depending on the context of your data, if you just have a quick uh, exploration, a quick sanity check, hey, does this make sense? This, you know, and, and that's why this, this quick st uh, statistical overview can also be quite interesting. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Thanks so much. Yeah, yes, I think it's, it's very clear. And just to complement, you know, in this session, we were exclusively using nine. But we also, we know we are offering many, many tools in the BGTI test infrastructure. And for example, when you're using Python or R, like maybe even Python using Jupyter Notebook, like we did in the first session, you can have the same um, summarization about, you know, the statistic table from your data set using just one command line. So that's also very, very easy in Python. And if you are curious, you can find a very nice book in the resource section uh, in, in our repositories. So that's always the first thing usually data analysis is going to do when it's approaching a new data set is really to check the quality of the data and check missing value, the limiters, uh, outliers, so understand if the quality is good or not at all good. Then I see another question in the chat is about, uh, uh, yeah, it's from Ioannis. He's asking, can I keep the result of the data uh, of the analytics I perform online, save on my computer? So I would say uh, that it depends. Uh, usually, if you are working in the big ETI environment, you are going probably to crunch a big amount of information. And that's why we have this environment where all the tools are integrated together and you can Im immediately inject your data, so your result, for example, in a database. This could be Postgre database or can be an uh, unstructured database, like Mongo database, eh? if you're using, for example, JSON. But in case you are doing something locally, eh? because these trainings, we, we already mentioned this in the first session, is also for people that are not using BDTI. If you are using locally uh, some of these tools, like NIME or Jupyter Notebook or R or Apache Superset, for example, you can store the information in your notebook. And of course, it depends on the amount of information. If it just says small CSV, definitely yes. If it's about a, a big database, I don't think you have uh, enough resources, but that's highly dependent on the use case. Exactly, and, and it's, the, the limit there is not the, the, the tool uh, or the tools that the exactly. BDTI framework 
it's literally the computing power. I mean, if you have some data set with 10 million rows and you want to do multiple operations on it, your computer will just not be able to handle it. But the tools that, that, that the BDTI suggest um, can handle it, and that's why they have the other tools, which we'll get to in the next session as well, to help you work with these bigger data sets. Um, I'm not sure if we still have time, Maria Claudia, for another question. Shall we just finish off with the final slides, or do you want to pop in one more? I don't see any remaining question, if I'm not wrong. So we can... Uh... Ah, no, there is still one question, sorry, it's just now. How would I generate an identifier with text followed by number in the same column? Example, you know, CDS 1, 2. So that, okay, if I understood correctly, Ronan, you're asking how to create a, a, an ID. It's about the concatenation between a string and a number. So I think you can use, uh, you can easily do this in Python with the concat com, uh, command, but in NIME it's even easier. We have a specific component, maybe Scott, you can elaborate a little bit more, but definitely there is a, a way of concatenating string plus ID and generate an, a, an ID. An identifier that's quite straightforward yeah there's it, probably a, a bunch of different ways of doing it you depending on on the data set you can use the group by node if you actually have two data sets you can use the concatenate node um, i think maybe we can take this quite question and just post it on the on the discussion board just yes. just to elaborate a bit more um, but yeah that's definitely possible depending exactly on the on the data that you're working with yeah yeah, we're going to share some concrete uh, example, uh, Roland, so you can have a look and try to replicate in, in your use case. Okay, so thanks a lot, colleagues. Thanks a lot uh, uh, to the participant. I think, you know, we are moving forward and you are really getting um, ready to start our uh, new BDTI pilot projects. So as we already mentioned at the beginning, in case you are working for the public administration and you are working also on something that is related to public good, public sector, please check our website. There is a very uh, easy uh, template. You can submit it and then we are more than happy to uh, provide you the, this environment. I would say that if you go to the next slide, uh, uh, just a small uh, final reminder is about the course discussion board that uh, Kim was already mentioning at the beginning. At the beginning, feel free to visit this board and to post there your question. And then don't forget about uh, our GitLab repository that you, I think is uh, in the next slide as well, so the, the link, where there you, you will find all the information, all the recordings, the slides we uh, used to, today, also the exercise. So you can practice and then uh, follow the next session. Thanks again.